When you look at my next guest on paper, you start to formulate an impression. American entrepreneur and frequent media resource for his mortgage and housing expertise, frequent guest on CNBC and Fox, CEO of NBS Highway, the industry's most highly regarded and recognized tool for transforming salespeople into advisors, two-time Crystal Ball Award winner in 2018 and 20 by Zillow and Plus Economics for the most accurate real estate forecasts out of 150 top economists in the United States, lead producer and managing partner of Book of Ages, the 27th longest running show on Broadway, producer of Chris Angel's Mind Freak at Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas, and if that wasn't enough, author of upcoming book, Money in the Streets. Barry Habib seems to be a serial entrepreneur in the business of economics, real estate, and entertainment. But after you talk to this guy, you realize he's really in the business of gratitude, joy, and service. And as you will hear, it's really hard not to like Barry. His passion and commitment to spoiling his employees and customers is inspirational and uplifting. And I was particularly fascinated by how he sees opportunities when others see problems, how he makes it his life's mission to serve others, and how he uses his intuition on a daily basis, even when the stakes are high. So Barry, great to have you on the show here today. Um, I was just thinking about how things have changed so much in our world, in the business world, from a standpoint of attitude since the beginning of this whole pandemic that started a few months ago. And I've certainly have noticed a different uh, kind of conversation around people's attitudes towards taking risk and whether or not they feel confident. And I know that you've been just extremely successful with so many different businesses and operations. Um, what does it take now to find good opportunities you know, the world is a little bit different than it was a year ago. Are the principles still there or do we need to somehow develop a new model? What do you think about that? I think that, uh, thanks for having me on, first of all, Dean. So it's really great to be with you. Uh, what, a, what a privilege it is to uh, be able to be on your podcast. And I want to start off by saying that opportunities are everywhere. And in fact, the more change and the more volatile the situation is, the greater the amount of opportunities are. So there's never a lack of opportunities. Opportunities are extraordinarily abundant. The trick is being able to see them. And that's what people need to hone their skills for. It's not that they, there are not opportunities. It's that they are not something that we're trained to be able to identify and focus on. And that's really the trick. And so if I'm a person who is, uh, maybe my world has been turned upside down, my business has been somewhat challenged and I, and, I, and I hear you and I think, Barry, you, you're absolutely right. I want to be able to see those opportunities, but I've got some blind spots. I've got something that's holding me back. What would your suggestion be, your advice be to a person who wants to take this idea that there's always opportunities, especially in situations like this? What would your suggestion be? So I think that there are so many different ways to identify opportunities. You know, when we look at when we look at times especially that are challenging, you know, you, you take a look at somebody like Sir John Templeton, a great investor who said, you want to be a, a buyer on the most pessimistic day and a seller on the most optimistic day. You know, Warren Buffett, who is going to tell you that you should be greedy when other people are fearful and vice versa, fearful when other people are greedy. And, you know, Nathan Mayer Rothschild back in 1815, uh, when he became the richest man in the world, what he said was, after making more money in one day than anybody had ever had at that point in time, they asked him how you did. And he said, you buy when there's blood in the streets. Mm. These principles tend to hold up very, very well in a timeless way. So if you look at, you know, if you look at the opportunities that are out there right now, um, there are so many, so many voids that have been created. If we want to talk about COVID, you know, for businesses. So, we know that uh, the dependency on China is something that, um, that we want to kind of try and move away from, especially in the pharmaceutical area where we're so dependent. We're discovering you know, we, we, we can't get some of the medical uh, tools or, or, or personal protection equipment or uh, medications in the generic world uh, because of the relationship that we have with China, which currently is strained in the dependency there. So you know, we're waking up to say, wait, well, you know, we, we've got to kind of become more independent there. And so you take a company like 
like Eastman Kodak, who Eastman Kodak was uh, pretty much dead in the water because they had messed up. They stayed with paper when everybody went digital and said, oh, no, nobody's ever going to give up the paper photograph. So they blew it. But now they have transformed themselves. They've realized an opportunity. We need to do this. So they say, hey, we deal with chemicals. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our factories and deal with chemicals and produce generic drugs here. And their stock has only gone up 600 plus percent in the day. So Exactly. Right. <laughs> so this is just one that's very current as we record this. But these things exist everywhere. Every time that you see, you know, Zoom, which we're on right now. Right. So Zoom went from a nice little tool that had all kinds of competition to thanks to COVID, you know, their stock is, is, has gone up, you know, tenfold and it's become ubiquitous. Um, all these companies that are taking a look at how to make working remotely easier have all taken advantage of this. Delivery of food, services like this. The, so anytime there's change, the key is to relieve points of friction. And I'd like to give you just a couple of quick mm. examples of how I've done that in the past. Please. So uh, in the mortgage business where I grew up, uh, people in the mortgage business that are selling mortgages would meet with a client. And meanwhile, interest rates are changing in the background. The market's always moving. So what if you quoted a customer, just pick a rate, say it's 4% interest rate. And as you're talking to that customer, the market's moving. And now you've promised that customer, yeah, we're going to give you 4%. And by the time you get back to your office, you discover that the market had moved. And now the rate's four and an eighth, four and a quarter percent. So what do you do? In that case, you go back to the customer, ruin your credibility and say, sorry, I know I quoted you four, but uh, it's four and a quarter. That's a problem. Uh, problem. The issue number two is you go to your company and say, listen, we, we, I can't go back and lose face. I promised them four. And then you make no money on the loan. Well, that's not going to help you. Or number three is you pray and hope the market improves. But all three choices are bad because you allowed yourself to be in it. That's a huge point of friction. So what I said is, why should that be? So when I took a look at this, I said, why don't we monitor the market for people in the mortgage industry and alert them when the market's about to change so they can warn their customer, protect their customer, keep happy clients, more deals, make money, and create an entire business uh, from that and brought that to the mortgage industry and created that as an opportunity. Back when I was doing loans, I had my own show on CNBC. People would always worry that it took a while to recover the closing costs. So I created a way that you could not build the closing cost in as a cost, but take an interest rate that was actually higher and in exchange, pay no closing cost. Mm -hmm. This concept, which I started to put out on CNBC in 1990 in my show there, became something that people utilize with huge success today because it saves people money that they need. There's no break-even period. So remove points of friction. When I got into entertainment and I put up shows like Chris Angel in, in Vegas, but with Rock of Ages on Broadway, I would watch people. I'd watch people come into the theater and they'd be a little late. Now there's Manhattan, you get a little traffic, you get there and you'd want to have a cocktail, right? Now there's a long line to get the cocktail. Then they spend $17 for one cocktail. And as they get the cocktail in their hand, you hear ding, 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 the lights flash. You got to get to your seats and you cannot have your drink in the seats. Mm. I would watch people beautifully dressed these attractive women with nice dresses go, 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 go because you don't <laughs> want to waste the $17, $17 per, prior to me for the drink. Right. And, and you want it because you can't take a seat. So I said, why do people have to suffer? Why can't we do it? And you know what they said to me? We've never done that before. We can't do it. Well, that's not a good answer for me. We've never done it before. Okay. That's right. completely unacceptable. So right. it, it took me a very long time, but I was the first show in the history of Broadway to allow drinking in the seats. And guess what? Dean, they all do it now. But I was the pioneer. I made that happen. Interesting. So what I do, remove points of friction. When I got into the medical imaging business, the medical imaging business, I knew from experience. Now, look, there's a lot of people listening. They've got great contacts with their doctor. Maybe they got their doctor's cell phone and they've got great relationship. But for the most part, you know, most of the population, much of us, we go for a scan, which is already something is scary because it could be bad news. We don't know what to expect. And then the tech who's doing it, they know what's going on. They can read it but they can't talk to you. And you're like, how's it look? Oh, your doctor will get back to you. And it might right. take your doctor, what, four or five days? You know what your brain does to you in those four or five days? Worries. Okay. Stress, anxiety, yep. right. can't sleep. What if the worst? You're praying. So I said, why do people have to suffer like this? I opened up a medical imaging business and put the radiologist on site. You know what? By the time you got dressed, they put it in this beautiful room. They showed you your scans and they reviewed it. And if it's good news, you walked out of there feeling like a million bucks. And if it wasn't the greatest news, at least you had a plan. 
At least you knew what you were dealing with and you knew how to be proactive to make progress. If you were to ask me, Dean, how do you define happiness? I tell you, if it's in one word, I choose progress. If hmm. you know you're moving forward, making progress, you're a lot happier. Look, if I want to lose 20 pounds, if I've lost five, I'm not at my goal, but I'm making progress and I feel happy. Okay, so this is what we need to do. We constantly have to make progress. So the point I'm trying to make here is relieve points of friction. And if you feel like I do, that there are points of friction everywhere, then you have opportunity that is absolutely endless. All you have to do is identify them. And by the way, don't ever talk yourself out of a good idea. Don't like, you know, put it there and then say, ah, no, don't do that. Okay, many of us, how many times have you seen something? Oh yeah, I thought about that. Yeah, I thought about You should be the person bringing that to market. You should be the person creating that. You need to be the one working on it. Does it take a lot of hard work? Heck yeah. Hell yeah. But don't be afraid of the hard work. Don't be afraid of the effort. And don't say, well, I'm doing this. Well, you know what? Raise your game. Do everything you do great. Don't sacrifice anything. Just raise your game to do everything you do well. Set a standard for yourself and do whatever it takes to accomplish that. Now, by the way, while we're talking about achievement goals and achievement success, and that's very important, you need to have that. You can't have that without fulfillment because a lot of really successful people that are very unhappy. So do what gives you fulfillment. For me, it's helping others. For many people, it's helping others. It's bringing people along. It's lifting them. It's doing the right things. And that's what brings fulfillment to you. That's mm -hmm. what makes your success and your achievement in conjunction with your beliefs so that that creates you to be a much more content and satisfied individual. That's now, a I'll great what, point. I, what, and I'm sorry to keep no, on going. No, it's keep wonderful. Going. Keep going. Keep going. So, Dean, when I was, uh, when I was in the mortgage business, right? Um, so, so, listen, I, I grew up really, really poor as a kid. My parents were immigrants. You know, they didn't even speak the language. I was completely unexpected and unplanned. And man, Dean, I just kind of got in under the wire. Listen to this. I was conceived months before birth control became available. Okay. So birth control pills <laughs> began. So I snuck in there, but get this, I was born before abortion was, was, um, uh, became legal. So I'm yes. kind of snuck in there, man. I'm on bonus time here and I'm going to make the most of it. Right. So right, right. my parents were dirt poor. Um, again, they came as immigrants. My mom was at the time, 40 years old. My dad was 57. Now today, maybe that isn't as crazy, but back then, man, that was crazy. Nobody was like that. Plus, dirt poor. They didn't want to have another kid. And it was very, very difficult for them. I go, I go into this and, and there's a lot of really tear-jerking stories in the book as to what they had to go through and, and, and all of these opportunities. But a lot of it is mindset and perspective. You know, uh, my mom worked in a sweatshop. And that's where they make dresses. And you see these people. You know, I actually have a picture of it in my, in my office here just to kind of always remind me of, you know, the struggles that they had. And she, she kind of she worked in a sweatshop. It was really grueling conditions. And when she was pregnant, she was just really worried. They're older. They're poor. They don't speak the language. And now a baby on the way on top of it. They already had two kids that were older. And trying to make ends meet was really, really hard for them. So she was upset. She was at her, at her machine and she was crying. And her boss came and she saw her and she said, hey, Karina, she says, what's wrong? What's wrong? And, and, and my mom, you know, was, was upset and she gathered herself. She says, look, you know, we're having this baby. I don't know. You know, my, we're, we're older. My husband's 57. You know, just, uh, we have no money. I don't know. How are we going to handle this baby? And her boss said to her, said, Karina, she says, I don't want you to worry. She says, I've always wanted to have a child, but I can't. She says, you give me the baby. She says, I'll give you everything. She says, I'll, I'll, I don't care. All I want is a baby. I'll, I'll go away. You can even have the business. And obviously in a moment, my mom just understood. She would never entertain that. But she understood in just a moment about perspective, mm. about what she had in her hands is a blessing. It's not a burden. And that made a very big difference. It was mindset. And mindset for me too is everything, Dean. How do you look at it? I start every single day, Dean, with gratitude. I start every single day listing and saying, I literally say it out loud after my cup of coffee. I like that little coffee first. All the things that I am so blessed and grateful for. And invariably, when things are going to happen, because they are, that are going to piss you off, that are going to get you, give you a little heartburn, you can take a little break and you can just think back because you've ingrained that in your brain every single day that this is not so bad 
when I put it in balance with all of the wonderful things that I am so, so lucky to have. So Barry, what are you grateful for? Well, I start off with my health always. I, I am always, I start off with thank you for today. Really, mm. just have a day. Thank you for today. Thank you for all the opportunity that I have. Thank you for, thank you to my parents for all the sacrifices that they made. And um, I am so grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my animals. I'm grateful for homes, cars, my business, my friends, my family, being able to laugh, being able to just, just being able to have freedom, to be able to walk, to be able to do things that I want to do. And I'm so grateful for all those and many, many more things. And I start off the day thinking along those lines. Hmm. And then you know what, man? Crap comes up and hits you. Okay, I'm human. I'll get a little bit upset. But you can gather yourself a lot more quickly and you can snap out of it and say, man, you know what? How many people would be begging to have my problems? Yeah, no kidding. So yeah. you mentioned your parents and your, the sacrifices they made. Was it that story that changed your mindset as a young lad that got you into this pattern that you were now experiencing? Or was there something else that happened that the light bulb went off and that all of a sudden you're, you're you know, because a lot of people, you know, this, um, most people do not move out of the economic uh, level that their parents were in. It's, 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 it's sort of statistically difficult to do that. And then you find a person like yourself came into this situation, very humble beginnings, and now all of a sudden you're doing quite, quite well. Was it, was there some other event that sort of took you into this other direction that far surpassed what your parents ever accomplished? So, you know, so many things go into that formula, right? Um, you know, a lot of the lessons, but my, my dad passed away when I was a young boy. So mm -hmm. um, my mom kind of raised me and although we were dirt poor, we'd ride the subways. If she sees somebody that was even worse off, we didn't have anything. But whatever she would have, she would give to somebody else. And she would mm -hmm. teach me that it's really good to give. It's really good to help other people. And she would teach me those lessons as a young boy. So I owe her so much. And what, what I discovered was, was that you know, there's a feeling that you get from helping others that, um, that just really is uplifting. And then there's laughter. You know what? Um, the richest person in the world and the poorest person in the world, if they're laughing, they're equal at that time. Right. right? right. They, they are, they're equal. You could, if you're experiencing joy, you don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have a lot of fortune. If you can experience joy, you're as rich as the richest person on earth. So experience joy and don't let others steal that from you. People let their joy be stolen. And what I mean by that is something upsets them, something pisses them off, and then they get in this bad frame of mind and they lash out against others and they make themselves unhappy and they make other people that they come into contact unhappy. And what you really can do is if you just change your mindset, I'm not saying it's that easy to do, but that's why start off with gratitude. Try to remember how good you have it and say, I'm not going to let this person steal my joy because our time's limited here and you'd rather spend it happy. And what's even better is that I'm not going to let that person or that incident steal the joy that I could bring somebody else. Yeah, now we're talking. Like, yeah, I love the, the way you're going on this, Barry, because I'm thinking about Tony Shea, and I think he had a book once called, was it Selling Happiness? You know, it was very popular back in the day when he was doing his business. And as I listen to you talk, it you have all these different businesses, but I don't even... In some ways, you're not in the business of mortgages and, and, and medical imaging and broad-based shows and so forth. It's, you're really like almost in the business of gratitude, joy, and service. That's, I mean, exactly. that's, sort of, that's really the focus. And these things are spinoffs of that. These are just happens to be the game you're playing. You could be anything, but that's really what you're all about. Am I fair to say that? Dean, you nailed it. And what my, here's, here's the deal. And I say this all the time. We have a very, very simple business philosophy. Some people have these old big mission statements. This and that. Mine's simple. We spoil our customers. We spoil our employees. That's it. Mm. We believe highly in loyalty and appreciation. People in this world, they don't get appreciated. Appreciate people. That means more than money, but treat them fairly financially too. Treat them great. I probably pay a little bit more, but you know what? It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Nobody ever asked me for an increase because I always give it to them before it's asked. And by doing so, what you say to that person 
is I've got your back. I notice how great you are. You have such enormous value. And that builds loyalty. Now, loyalty is really, really, really an important thing. I think people overlook how critical loyalty is. Loyalty is so important. And it's easy to be loyal when everything's great. Remember that song, you know, um, too much time on my hands. You know, I got dozens by sticks. Got dozens <laughs> of friends and the fun never ends. That is as long as I'm buying, right? So right. yeah, everybody wants to be your friend when everything's good, when you're, when you're paying for it, when you get, but everybody wants to be a friend. But you know who your friends are? It's when, when things suck for you. Yep. Those people that are with you to lift you, to help you, to care about you when times suck, that's who your real friends are. And what, what we need to be able to do is to be that for other people and let them know that and, and show that. In fact, I don't do this all the time, but when there is someone in my life like that, if I send them a note, my signature and they know it and they like it is I don't sign it, you know, was just with my name or yours truly or whatever it is. I sign it, your loyal friend hmm. there. And they know that I'm a loyal friend to them. They know that I will always be there for them. And if we can build relationships like that, um, life's about relationships, Dean. Yep. Good relationships will make your life so much better with whoever it is, with your favorite waiter, with, 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 with even with, believe it or not, I mean, big Yankee fan, go to get the bathroom attendant, okay? Just people, if you respect them, regardless of who they are, it will mean so much to them and it'll make you feel so good to be kind and acknowledge that what they're doing is really important. See, I learned that because you know, my parents was that person. You know, mm -hmm. when, um, when my kids were little, I tried to teach the lesson. And, you, know, you have to plant the seeds when the ground is fertile. When my kids were little, I remember this one time, now I started making some money and my son, Dan, and my daughter, Nicole, they're twins and they were little. And you know, kids are kids, right? So, so you have to forgive them and indulge them and stuff. And my son, was talking about one of his friends and, and he had more toys than they had or games than they had. And he was like, ah, you know, we have, and they don't have that. I was like, Dan, what you have to realize is that when I was a little boy, I had nothing. So that was me. So if you're making fun of that person, it's like you're making fun of me. Mm. And boy, did that kind of like sink in. Mm. And, you know, it's moments like that. And I'm so proud of the way they are and the way they treat others and the respect and kindness that they have towards others. So, you know, if you can teach these lessons, like my mom taught me, like I try to teach my kids about kindness, about respect, um, we just need more of that. Yeah, for sure, especially now. Hey, I want to pivot real quick here. So when you think about the relationships you engage with or the businesses you decide to take on, opportunities out there, Certainly you've got a lot of information that you're trying to amass and understand what's happening, but do you find at times that you've made a decision to do something just on gut? Your intuition said, this absolutely feels right. Because I'm hearing this all the time with the very successful people is at some point they let the data go and they let their, their gut come out. Can you give us a story when you decided to do something that may not have made sense on paper, but it sure did make sense in your intuition and it turned out to be the right thing to do? Almost every decision, almost really? every, almost every, it's the, the, if I would give you my biggest, my biggest success change was learning to trust my gut and listen to it. If I'm feeling like I should back off, I don't try and talk myself into it. If I'm feeling that this is something I go for, I don't let the naysayers hold me back. I think about what's the worst that can happen. Okay. Mm. So I, I weigh the risks, certainly, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say, listen, I think I should, you know, jump off this building, you know, but uh, you have to weigh the risk and you have to be smart about it. But ultimately making the decision, you should go with what you feel in your gut and learn to trust that. Do not suppress that, but cultivate it. You know, I was so poor, I had no toys, so I had to cultivate creativity as a kid. I had nothing to play with. So I used to play with freaking matchbooks and stuff like that. You know, like I used to roll up socks and throw it into the lampshade. That was my basketball. Okay. So, <laughs> but that we all have this amazing creativity. If you foster it and it's never too late, if you foster it, you'll be amazed at how creative you can become. So having creativity is so important. It makes life a lot more fun, by the way. So are you no, making a distinction between intuition and creativity or are they separate? I'm saying it all comes together, Dean. It Got all it. comes together. Because if you trust your gut, you allow yourself to be more creative. Agreed. 
you know, because you could be creative and then you could say, well, no, that's too risky. I don't want to do that. You know, I'm a little afraid to do that or I should, but man, bring out that creativity, take a risk. You're going to lose sometimes, but if you're not, if you're not taking risks that don't happen, you're not taking enough risks because you'll never, you'll never hit that good shot either. You know, right. and what you'll discover is you hone that in and you start hitting more and more and more and more of those good ones. So let me ask you about your book, Money in the Streets. What are some of the main points that are the reason for writing the book? So the reason for writing, so, so when, when my parents came here, um, they were immigrants and they were very, very poor, as I mentioned to you, and they heard stories about America as such a rich country. You know, America is so rich and so many immigrants that you know, people who have immigrant parents or grandparents or immigrants themselves that are listening right now, they will relate to this. People talk about America if you're in another land and say, America is such a rich country. There's gold in the streets. There's money in the streets. All you got to do is pick it up, right? <laughs> and I was a little boy and my mom would tell me this story. And it was a little funny, but it was also sad because they didn't quite find the abundance that they were told that existed here in America. But as I literally started in business, and one of the things was selling stereo equipment out of the trunk of my car and making money and getting into other businesses before my mom passed. I remember sitting down with her and I said, you know, mom, you're right. There really is money in the streets. All you have to do is be able to see it, pick it up and do good with it. And that gave me a lot of happiness to be able to have that conversation with her and tell her that she was right because we all have that ability. We could, if we just look for it, if we just understand that we should trust our gut and our intuition and do the research and do it, and see it through, you will have so much success. There really is money in the street. So the title is, uh, is, is to honor my mom for, for that concept. But all the stuff within the book will help you if you're having a bad time, and we all have bad times. It'll maximize the good times you have. And there's a lot of fun stories. And while the stories are stories that I share, they're not about me, they're through me. And what they'll do is help you find opportunities, help you be able to capitalize on them and make them work. It's really a playbook that people have said that they want to read over and over and over again. Uh, it's very inspiring and uplifting, but it really is strategic as well on how you can make sure that not only in business, but in fulfillment that you're reaching higher levels. Fantastic. And Barry, last question. How do you want to be remembered? Well, I really want to be remembered as someone who you could trust, someone who, who, who made you feel better every time you came into contact with me, um, someone that inspired you. Uh, I, want, uh, I want to be remembered as someone who was innovative and, and, uh, and did his very, very best to leave things better um, after I had been there. Great. Thanks for being on the show. Wonderful to, to meet you. Such a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much, Dean. You bet.